The government is upon his shoulders. Part two. I want you to know that Jesus is ruling and reigning over his kingdom. Amen. Now, now, in heaven and in earth, Amen. he has overcome the world. Amen. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. He overcame and is set down with His Father in His throne. His right hand and His holy arm have gotten Him the victory. Oh, praise God. Daniel said, One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples beheld Jesus and it said He was taken up And a cloud received him out of their sight. And I think Daniel was given in a measure to see the other side of that cloud. Here comes Jesus returning from battle. Victorious over sin. Victorious over death. Returning to the Father. Came to the Ancient of Days and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given Him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Amen. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Can you just picture Jesus returning into the heavenly realms? Victorious. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Who is this that cometh from Edom? With dyed garments from Basra. This that is glorious in His apparel. Traveling in the greatness of His strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat? He tread the wine press alone. Jesus returning to the Father. Oh, blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This returning into Jerusalem, it was really pretty pitiful. Maybe it's the best that earth could do. But think about Jesus returning to heaven. He wasn't meek and lowly, riding upon an ass. He was glorious in His apparel. Victory in His hand. The keys of hell and death won. And if there are any stones in heaven, they were crying out, Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna to the Lord of David. I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. You know what that is? 100 million. Still not enough. And thousands of thousands. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We're running out of words to use here. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea And all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. God hath raised Christ from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. Heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. 
not only in this world, but in that also which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and hath given him to be the head over all things to the church. And we are reigning with him. Amen. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests. Brother Doug was just telling me he's king of kings and we're kings and priests. Amen. And we shall reign on the earth. I hope you're reigning now, brethren. Twice in Revelation it says we're made kings and priests. We're a royal priesthood in Peter. Offering up spiritual sacrifices. But Christ has been raised up to heavenly places. He's not a passive figurehead of a prince who's not involved in the affairs of the kingdom. The government is upon his shoulder. It means that he is, has responsibility for governing. He is ordering and establishing the kingdom. I think that's good news. Well, going back a little bit, first of all, let's establish that God is over all. God has ruled over the affairs of this world. Since he created it and his grasp on power has never slipped. What are two sparrows sold for? A farthing? Well, Jesus said, one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Amen. How about that for detail? He has control over nature. He has control over politics. God is judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Sometimes he makes the basest of men kings. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. He is a great king over all the earth. God has been ruling over this world, but in a sense it's been behind the scenes. Men have been blind to it. And what blindness that is. How great is that darkness. To Nebuchadnezzar. This is the word from Daniel 4.17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers. God has watchers. And the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? God is over all. David said, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is Thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and Thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of Thee, and Thou reignest over all. And thine, in Thine hand is power and might, and in Thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. But Satan also has a kingdom. He is called the prince of this world, the prince of the power of the air, working in the children of disobedience. He's called the god of this world. The working of Satan, it says, is with power and signs and lying wonders. He said to be the father of the rebellious. Jesus said, you, are, you do the lusts of your father. 
False apostles are said to be Satan's ministers, and whoever commits sin is of the devil. We wrestle not against principalities and powers. We wrestle against principalities and powers, excuse me, rulers of the darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's this rebel kingdom, of course, under God. Paul was sent to open their eyes to turn them from the power of Satan unto God. But here's what's happened. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom in return, but his citizens hated him. Sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. And God has allowed this. There is a whole realm where people and devils and angels of devils say, we will not have this man to rule over us. How did a government form that was not on Jesus' shoulder in the first place? All things were made by Him and for Him. Well, Jesus said, you could have no power over Me at all except it were given thee from above. So God has allowed this rebellion, rebellious kingdom to form and continue unto this day. Amen. In the garden to man, God blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. God gave dominion to man. Now in Hebrews chapter 2, What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. And there is nothing that was not put under him. But he says... (laughs) but we see not yet all things put under him things aren't under man yet what did Jesus say whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin how can you have dominion if you're a servant you have no dominion you're a slave the flesh said sin and you sinned you're not having dominion. There's rebellion. You, Adam, lost his dominion. But we see Jesus. Amen. So now there's a man. <laughs> we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Adam lost the dominion, and Jesus has taken it back. So now, he says to you, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You're to rule over it that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. Jesus has taken back the dominion that Adam lost. Now as kings and priests, we are to reign. But there is this rebel kingdom all around us. But I want you to know that Christ has spoiled it. Satan's head has been bruised. Jesus said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. Nothing they can do about it. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he is come upon him and overcometh 
overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. And Matthew said that he binds the strong man and spoils his house. Well, that's what Jesus has done. He's taken from Satan the armor wherein he trusted and he's dividing the spoils. Well, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. He's stronger than the strong man. So he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Do you believe that, brethren? So, these are, these are like, they're promises. They are set out there and they contain limitless power. You're being tempted. You draw upon this promise. Satan has been destroyed. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Because of what Christ has done, because of the victory won, because of the exalted Christ, we have dominion. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that He might destroy the works of the devil. And He was manifest, wasn't He? He did destroy the works of the devil. He is reigning now. Jesus came to them, His disciples, after His resurrection, and He said, All power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. Not just the kingdoms of this world like Satan tempted Him. But all power in heaven and in earth. To what purpose is this power and how is it applied? Jesus said, all power is given me in heaven and in earth. And now his disciples know from this point on, nothing can happen to them except God allows it. But wait a minute. No, no, no. That was true before. Nothing could happen to God's people unless He allowed it. God has always had control over circumstances, over the wills of men. He can save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No one can touch His people. Well, what? to what purpose then is this power now that Jesus has? And how is it used? He said, go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is the purpose and use of the power that's been given to Christ. He's bringing many sons to glory. The power of sin was broken. And now men from all nations are repenting. They're being baptized. They're calling on the name of the Lord. Washing away their sins in the life-giving blood of Jesus. The blood of the Lamb. Jesus is now the captain of salvation. And He's bringing many sons to glory. This is the power Jesus was given. To set up His kingdom. Like Joseph's brothers came back to Jacob and told him that Joseph was alive and he's governor over all the land. (laughs) He was dead before from Jacob's perspective and now he's alive and he's governor over all the nations. And when the Egyptians were famished, the people came to Pharaoh. He said, go to Joseph. (laughs) What he says to you do. So now Jesus is head over the kingdom. He is dispensing and administering the kingdom of God. You go to Him if you want anything. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by Him. There's none other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. You have to go to Jesus to get anything from God. He is the man who has restored dominion. Well, some might ask, when will the kingdom come? Jesus said there are some that are standing here that will not taste death till they have seen the kingdom come in with power. 
Now, he is very specific here. He said there's some that are standing here. So you couldn't misinterpret this as him saying like an age, this generation will not pass away. He said there's some standing here who will not die till they see the kingdom of God coming in power. The Pharisees demanded Jesus, when will the kingdom come? You know what he said? The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus isn't coming back to this earth to reign in Jerusalem. And if someone tells you he's in Jerusalem or in the desert or in the secret chambers, believe it not. When Jesus comes back, there's not going to be any more earth. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The kingdom of God is not outward, physical. It is within you. It is a spiritual kingdom. And Jesus set it up and established it in His resurrection and giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Oh, wait for it. Wait for the power, brethren. Don't run off on your own. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so then the Spirit of the Lord is poured upon us from on high. And the wilderness becomes a fruitful field. And the fruitful field would be counted for forest. What is the kingdom of God? Brethren, we are born in a condemned world. Our alienation from God and the resulting participation in sin has left us dead in transgressions and sins without hope and without God in the world. And brethren, the kingdom of God is the escape hatch from a condemned world. It's like the ark was to Noah. It was like bringing Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. This world is condemned. It is going to be destroyed. The only way out is to be in Christ's kingdom. The only way to be in Christ's kingdom is you have to be born there. You cannot see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And so by the power of God, by His grace, by the victory of Jesus, we can be born again, made new creatures, entering into the kingdom of God by His grace. It is within us. God has set up a kingdom. And it is an eternal kingdom. Daniel said in the days of these kings, so there were four images, four kingdoms. There was the Babylonian, the Medes and the Persians, the Grecians, and then the Romans. And he said, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. This is an eternal kingdom. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Isn't it good to be part of an eternal kingdom? He must reign until his he hath put all enemies under his feet. That means he's reigning now. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So this is the situation, brethren. We have enemies all around us. Satan has a kingdom, but it's been spoiled. But Jesus is ruling right there in the midst of His enemies. Well, the resurrection of Christ, He is declared to be both Lord and Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. 
angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Now, if you'd like, I'd like to look at Revelation chapter 12 for a minute. If you'd like to turn there, sometimes it helps to see it on the page. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5, there's a woman who brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This is no doubt Jesus Christ, the Messiah, born of a virgin coming from Israel, the seed of the woman. He dies for the sins of the whole world and is caught up to God, to his throne. And then verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there found place any more in heaven. And the dragon was cast out. The dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength. Sometimes uh, we get discouraged when we see the lack of interest in spiritual things all around us. The dead churches. But brethren, I want you to know in heaven, there's a loud voice. No timid or embarrassed or shamed of Jesus voices. There's a loud voice in heaven. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So he said, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. That's us. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. I hope that's not us. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And so then he went to persecute the woman that brought forth the man child. The resurrection of Christ and ascension to the Father coincides with Satan being cast down out of heaven and into the earth. It is, de- it is accomplished upon the basis of the accuser of the brethren being cast down. The accuser of the brethren, his basis for accusation is sin, and Jesus Christ has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Sin has been put away. The accuser of the brethren is cast down. There's no more basis for accusation in God's elect. And who shall lay any charge? Jesus' words, even when he was on the earth, indicated that change was coming. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Perhaps a prevision. Perhaps the kingdom was already beginning to topple as Jesus was entering in and taking power and authority over all these devils. Now is the judgment of this world, he said. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He said the prince of this world is judged. John sixteen eleven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations, the Gentiles? And now, Jesus preaches the gospel to all nations. The kingdom's location. Where is it? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not here. It's not in this building. It's not made out of bricks and mortar 
The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, Jesus said. It is within you. Well, here's what happened. We were dead in sins. He quickened us together with Christ. And what did He do? He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Now, what happened to the accuser of the brethren? He was cast down. We were raised up. Well, Jesus first came down, put away sin, went back up. Satan's cast down, and we go up. Amen. Amen. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? This isn't our home. Our, our life is hid with Christ in God. We are walking and dwelling in heavenly places. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, your life is hid with Christ in God. The kingdom of God has come in power. When the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Amen. That's what the Scripture says. He said to Peter, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is building His kingdom. Well, with Satan cast down now, brethren, what about a charge against God's elect? Who's going to lay a charge against God's elect? It's God that justifieth. What about he that condemneth? Where is he? Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Well, what about the love of Christ? Can anything separate us from that? No. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. I'm persuaded. Neither life nor death, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Since it is a spiritual kingdom, you must be born into it. This illustrates the importance of faith in the kingdom. It is by faith we have this. And there is this vital connection with Christ in His kingdom. The government is upon His shoulders. Well, to be in His kingdom, this is my final point. To be in His kingdom, you have to let this man rule over you. I know there are many that say, Lord, Lord. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Now, Jesus' kingdom is characterized by obedience. His servant shall be willing in the day of His power. Being made perfect, He became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him. You have to let this man rule over you. Or don't be calling Him Lord. We must be submitted to Him. Oh, what a joy it is to submit to Him. All this inner wrestling and struggle about not willing to yield to Christ. There's such a freedom just to let go of all of that. And you know that he he said that he would make you willing. It's God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If you're struggling with this uh, yielding to God, I mean, to let him really rule over you. God is the one who does this work in you. Call upon Him. Lord, make me willing. Drive out 
the unsubmitted inhabitants of the land. Work in my heart and make me want to obey you. He won't accept any grudging obedience. He wants willing servants. But the Lord gloriously does this. You know, all power is given to Jesus in heaven and in earth. And so, subduing your will is no problem for Him. You just offer it to Him. Amen. Thank you, brethren.